What is your? Wait, wait. Are, we, are we rolling? Yeah, it's, it's telling me. It's, yeah, it's rolling. Okay, here we go. Good morning. Good morning. So, you know, going into this centennial event, what is your story in relationship to the history of the Apaches and the events that we are commemorating? Well, I'd like to, to say that um, the Chiricahua Apaches have been through a lot of hard times, but they survived the hard times, you know. I always talk to the people here in Mesoclera and I tell them they're good people, they're brave people, they're strong people. And I think that um, not too many people or the country, the world, isn't aware of what they did, what they stood for. I think. A lot of uh, what America celebrates today also belongs to the Chiricahua people. As far as I can see, the Chiricahua people have gone through some of the most tragic times any Indian nation could go through. You know, spending 27 years as prisoners of war, I believe that a lot of the language, a lot of the traditions, the culture was lost. And these are some of the things that I believe this two-day celebration is going to be able to show the world. And I think that it's about time the Chiricahuas were recognized for who and what they are. And that makes me feel good today. It's about time. And obviously, as your name says, Cochise, Cochise your direct ancestors and families of whom? Cochise and his wife. I'm, I'm sure that his mom and dad, I've heard their names, but I can't remember. But Cochise always lived in that area that is known as the Stronghold and into the Chiricahua National Park. And that was his home, that was his homelands. I believe that he traveled into Mexico several times too. And in fact, I was able to travel to some of the places that he uh, visited a lot, and there was even times when I visited a, uh, a prison where he was put in jail for about seven days. Anyway, it's just to tell a story about the lands that belonged to them, Arizona, Mexico, a little bit of New Mexico. I mean, you know, Arizona was mostly the oh. homelands of the Chiricahua people. What is the most important thing you want people to know about the events we are commemorating? I believe that, you know, there's a lot of talk about the heroes that uh, America has. Well, the, the Apache people have heroes too, you know, but it's something that Indian people really don't talk about. I, I believe that some of the movies that you see today, some of the activities that are put on films, and the documentaries that are coming out, such as this is beginning to let the people or the world know exactly where the Apaches were and who they are. And I'm proud of that too, because I think the story needs to be told. And I don't know if the things I say are gonna be able to answer some of the questions that the world might have. But then there are certain groups in the world that are pretty proud of the Apache people. And I hope that what's happening now can give a little more information to the world. Now, obviously part of this celebration is to celebrate the Apache Freedom Runners. And I've read that they were known as Spirit Runners. Can you tell us anything about these incredible athletes? Our leaders, you know, we talk about Cochise, we talk about Mangus, Colorado. We talk about Loco, we talk about Chihuahua. These weren't chiefs of a whole nation or anything. They were small groups. I'd say maybe the most they had was about 35 or 40. And that was their group, and they traveled from places to places, in, into Arizona, into Mexico, and maybe even into Utah or some of the other places, Oklahoma, maybe, in their earlier days. And so, the leaders of these small groups always taught their people to be on high ground. They don't like to be on the low ground. And everywhere they went, they had sentries, guards, 
to look over the small group that was camped anywhere. These are the trainings that our leaders gave their people so that they were safe all the time, close to water. They had uh, sentries surrounding their camps, and it was always close to water and some kind of activity, you know, because they were they liked to roam. They never stayed in one place too long. Um, I believe that these are some of the the reasons that they existed for so long. You know, when uh, the dominant society started coming into their country, it made a great change in the lives of our Indian people, especially the Apaches, because they were nomads. They roamed the country and they owned a big part of Arizona, Mexico, and uh, New Mexico. That's fantastic. But they, they, so a lot of them, they actually ran before they had actually horses. They ran these long distances, no? They were great runners. The leaders of these groups that I'm talking about, too, trained their warriors from the time they were maybe even three or four years old. And the first thing was how you could get food from nature itself where you could get water, where you could get food. And the running was a part of the training, was a part of the growing up. They made run, people run distance. They made them run up hills, up high country. They ran in low country to deal with the altitude. You know, these are some of the things. The Apache people almost had a way of life that nobody really understood. And I believe that was why they're still here on this earth today. The runners are great. You know, my grandfather talked about training young people, putting a drink of water in their mouth and making them run for six, seven miles, even 10 miles during the training period. And later on, the distance that they ran just became a little further. And that's why they were always in good physical condition. Lean and mean it goes with that. <laughs> What happened to them after they surrendered? Because they were never captured. I think that really broke the, the feeling of life, the feeling of freedom, the feeling of the Apache way of life, the Apache spirit. It wasn't taken away. It was still there, but it wasn't as strong as before the uh, dominant society came in. I think the culture began to change, the, their country began to change, the traditions that they had. These are some of the things that gave strength to the little groups that resided in their part of the country. And I think people began to move in and it created chaos for a lot of our people. Um, even today, I believe that it affects the generation that we live in today, the change that has taken place over the years. I look at our young people and uh, uh, sometimes I wonder if they, they look like lost souls because the old people aren't here, the tradition, the culture, the prayers, the songs are not there. And so that creates a big change. I know they eventually ended up in Fort Seals, Oklahoma. What was the journey like from Fort Seals back to the Reds when they were released in 1913? Well, to go back a little further, they were taken out of Arizona and then taken to Texas, San Antonio, Texas, and then on into Florida. A few years there and then on into Mobile, Alabama. A few years there and then finally into Fort Seal, Oklahoma. Fort Seal, I believe that the the Chiricahuas were pretty much uh, adapted to the dominant society's way of life. And I believe that their imprisonment was good in a sense, as bad as it was to them. But I think it created a whole new way of life for them to be among um, people in Texas, people in Florida, Alabama, you know, these created a change for them 
and sometimes you have to look at the good side of it in spite of the punishment and uh, the sad times that they had. I think that that created a change of their way of life. And so I look at today as something good and then something sad in a period of time of the Chiricahua Apaches. And, and what is life like now on the reservation, the Mescalero Reservation? Now, you know, um, we have three bands of Apaches that make up the Mescalero Apache tribe. The Lepan people were here around the 1900s. The Muscularos, this is their home. This is their homelands. But the Lepan tribe came in from Texas. They were an Apache group too that came in and were invited by the Muscularo Apaches around 1900, 1903. Then later the Chiricahuas came in. And the move was, their last station to be imprisoned was for Sil, Oklahoma. It was, um, I'm not sure if it was an army post, a military post back at that time, but anyway, they were brought there from Alabama. You know, the movements from the different states, the different climates that they were adapted to, I'd say the Apache nation of the Chiricahua people was almost cut in half because of the location because of um, the el uh, altitudes and the change of the seasons. This created a lot of chaos for them. And so I believe that the imprisonment and then finally coming to Fort Sill, Oklahoma, um,